Good morning, friends and colleagues. I am Professor Jesus Vai, and I teach in the ARC English Department, and I also direct the Native American Resource Center here at American River College. Once again, I am proud to stand here to introduce the ARC Indigenous Land Statement. The use of Indigenous Land Statements provides a platform for authentic dialogue about the relationship between institutions and local Native nations. I am proud to say that ARC continues to lead the region's colleges and universities in how we have engaged this important process. Over the course of the last year or so, you have heard from elders, tribal leaders, and ceremonial captains. Today, I present to you the voice of the ARC Native American students themselves. Our ARC Native American students are strong and resilient. We have our traditional lifeways, however, the path through a contemporary system of Western education presents unique challenges to Native people. We continue to lack for role models in most spaces. There is an epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. Our communities are plagued by depression and self-harm. But we need this to be understood. It is not that there is something wrong with us. We have been made sick by a system historically designed to erase us. The ARC Indigenous Land Statement is part of a reconciliation and healing process whose importance cannot be overstated. The students before you speak for a lived native history and reality, and they embody the struggle of our ancestors. Those ancestors, out of love, ingenuity, and courage, never gave up against relentless odds so that these students could stand proudly here today. It is important for our Native students' voices to be heard, for them to be seen, for the people and the land to be recognized. Allow me to introduce Yamani Hendrick. He works in our Native American Resource Center. He is Maidu, Taos Pueblo, Ute, and Chickasaw. He is a young person who has already contributed to his Native community through leadership and wellness and mentoring of others. He works hard and helps his family in many ways. I'd also like to introduce Pauline Ghost. Uh, she works in our Native American Resource Center as well, and she is Lakota and Miwok. Pauline has also worked on campus as a clerk for EOPNS. Pauline is a great example of perseverance and determination, and she is helping many other Native students through her example. Please join me in welcoming our ARC Native American students. Hasasika, Nikyam Kakan Yamani Hedrick. Hello, everyone. My name is Yamani Hedrick. Um, this is, will just be my second semester here at ARC, coming up here in the spring. And, um, you know, as my first year, it definitely has not been easy at all. It's been a very big transition to go from um, a high school environment where, you know, the things that were most important were like who Shelly was dating and clothes, <laughs> or, you know, which phone you have, and if you don't have the right one, you're a loser, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, to, you know, kind of transition to something that's, you know, very much more, uh, you know, grounded in reality to me. You know, there's a lot of uh, adult life here. You know, ARC campus is, is um, very diverse. And it's been, it's been a, a kind of a, a culture shock to me, you know, to go from, you know, things that seemed so minute and, like, didn't matter really in high school to, you know, start caring about more important things. And I think, you know, I've had so much uh, more to put on my plate, you know, starting with college and all the new classes and, you know, having to deal with, you know, you know real adult stuff and paying rent or insurance and stuff. But, you know, one thing that I think has kind of really consistently uh, stayed out with me through all of this is that, you know, uh, the one thing that I should really be focused on doing and something that I have uh, definitely been able to here at ARC is focusing on uh, the Native problems here, uh, you know, in the community that I can, I can help uh, and face and deal with and also to bring new events to the Native people on camp, not only on campus but also in the community. You know, this has been a, a very good experience for me because, uh, you know, if I was to go to a, a college that didn't really have any real connection to their, you know, their Native program, I might not have had the, you know, the connections and the experiences and now like the kind of, uh, the decisions that I've been able to make to, you know, kind of decide where I am going and who I am as a person if I wasn't here at ARC. And, you know, one of, one of the other great things about ARC is that, you know, I've uh, been consistently able to actually read this land statement, and I think that's say saying something a lot about, you know, um, ARC, but also I want to thank Jesus for, you know, always picking me to uh, do it whenever he does because uh, it's really important to me that we do read the land statement. You know, as a member of the of Maidu, uh, a tribe we're not actually federally recognized and you know a land statement might not seem like much but it's a first step and you know if we can get people talking about it if we can get people to understand it then you know hopefully I can then someday in my lifetime see you know the steps and hopefully try to bring my, my tribe to get federally recognized but yeah this is very important to me thank you
Hello, my name is Pauline Ghost, and I am Lakota in Miwok. I have been attending ARC since fall 2012. I am a former foster youth, and I was uh, raised in the foster youth system from ages 5 to 16. Um, I am attending ARC to one day be a Native American foster child counselor. Um, I'm proud to be a Native American ARC student, uh, and I'm proud to work for the ARC Native American Resource Center. Um, there was a part of my life where I was disconnected from my traditions, even though I grew up traditionally in a Native American foster home. I ventured off and chose drugs and alcohol. I am now clean and sober, uh, six years. And I'm back at Native American Resource Center trying to, um, you know, find my roots again. And I'm ready to take on this semester. The American River College Indi Indigenous Land Statement. We acknowledge the land which we occupy today as the traditional home of the Nissan, Maidu, and Miwok tribal nations. These sovereign people have been the caretakers of the land since immemorial. Despite centuries of genocide and occupation, the Nisenam, Maidu, and Miwok continue as vibrant and resilient tribes and bands, both federally recognized and unrecognized. We take this opportunity to acknowledge the generations that have gone before, as well as the present day Nisenam, Maidu, and Miwok people. We are definitely for, uh, fortunate to have a Native American center on our campus. Not very many community colleges do. So thanks, Jose. I mean, I'm sorry, Jesus. <laughs> sorry about that. Now I'd like to introduce our Senate presidents. We have Olga, Eliza, and Aisha. Good morning, everyone. Happy 2020 and happy convocation. Uh, my name is Elisa Shev. I am serving as your academic senate president. Uh, to be honest, I'm a little surprised to hear my own voice say those two words, happy and convocation, in the same sentence. Uh, because I gotta, be, I gotta tell you, and some of you may know this, historically speaking, convocation has not exactly been my favorite event. Uh, I mean, let's be honest, it's early, it's a Friday. And I've always seen it as being that one mandatory meeting that faculty have to attend before the real work begins, which is next week in class. Um, but from this limited perspective of mine, I was just thinking as an instructor that the education of my students begins when I meet them in my class, which again is not until Tuesday. My perspective is changing, and that is because American River College, we're changing. Uh, from my changed and different perspective, I think it's not my students, it's our students. And the education of our students begins long before they ever meet me, long before they ever come to my class or any class. The education of our students begins with all of us here at American River College from every interaction that our students have with us. And the education of our students is something that we are all doing together. And you know, with so many of us in the room and different folks in the room today, uh, it, the convocation starts to feel different to me. Convocation is feeling more now like the real meaning of the word, to convocate, to come together, because um, we're all coming together. And I feel really honored and privileged and happy to be standing in a room full of such amazing educators. And I'm not just talking to faculty, I love you faculty, uh, but I'm talking to everybody in the room. We are all educators. If you work here at American River College, you are working in the field of education. And we're doing a lot of work. 
Uh, with this in mind, I want to give a little uh, shout out to the work of the professional development uh, professional development and training project team. Uh, today you are being invited to view a display, it's over there, check it out, uh, the, of the work of the team. Uh, this display is a description of what the team, how the team envisions professional development at American River College. There's a list of a short uh, series of competencies that we believe the college should be invested in bringing up. Uh, for all of us, and uh, it's a it's a interactive display. There's post-it notes, so you can uh, give us some feedback and put down any ideas that you might have for professional development training that you want to see or that you believe someone else needs to have. Uh, put those on post-it notes and see how that might uh, correspond to the competencies that are listed there. Uh, so please, during the breakouts or uh, after convocation, stop by that display and give us uh, your input. Uh, last semester, I attended a professional development event, Beware of the Colonization of Governance. And during that event, I had the opportunity at a breakout uh, conversation, I had an opportunity to uh, speak to uh, outreach specialist Jerry Marshall. I don't know if you know Jerry, but uh, Jerry shared with me a lot of his perspective and wisdom. And one thing that Jerry said was that uh, he wished uh, for all of us here at American River College to really view one another as educators. So I, I really want to thank Jerry for those words. And I want to let you all know that the professional development and training plan is designed with the growth of each one of us as employee educators in mind. So enjoy today's convocation. I'm enjoying convocation a lot more. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to uh, pass the mic over to Olga Prispilov. Good morning, ARC family. On behalf of the classified, I'd like to welcome you to this new decade and the spring 2020 semester. What I want to talk about today is what it takes to be part of this family, of the ARC family. How do we become family, or are we? In the past couple of semesters, we have been going through a lot of equity work as a campus. And do we know if it's really making a difference or not? Is that what it takes for us to be become part of this family? One of the big aspects of equity is to be able to speak up when it's time to speak up. So today I'd like to use this opportunity to speak up for one of the groups on this campus and I'll call them my people and you'll see why. And it's not just classified, yes, classified are very important, but I'd like to talk about a subgroup, okay? When we went through the Common Read this fall, one of the biggest things that stuck out for me was um, the author recognized linguistic diversity. So diversity of people who, for whom English is not their first language, or English, English learners, which I am one of them. A lot of these people, they come from different countries, they come um, at different stages of their lives, and sometimes they're treated as invalids, or as people with a disability because they don't speak English. And that's not always the case. I don't know if any of you know, we have an AA on this campus who used to work for, as an engineer for many years in Romania. And sometimes we think about people like that and we're like, oh, they, they come from a life that I don't know. And when I think about people like that, I'm sure some of you heard um, the other translations of what American Rural College stands for, ARC. People call it the All-Russian College or the American Russian College. <laughs> Jokes aside, we're here, right? There are a lot of white people on this campus who do not speak English. <laughs> and when we think about people like that, where, do, where does someone like me belong? I don't belong to the white dominant culture because I'm foreign, right? I don't belong to the people of color because I'm white. <laughs> and that's why a lot of the times when you ask a Russian, are you white, they answer with, no, I'm Russian. <laughs> because for us, that's something else. And even when I say Russian, what I really mean is anyone of Slavic descent. And that's a lot more people than just Russians. So when we see people like that in our classrooms, when we see employees who are in front of us, 
Are we part of the family? I would say yes. And I think that the equity work that has been going on on our campus, it helped us see those, that intersectionality of people that is in each group that we see. It helps us um, look at the individual and not look past the differences, but look directly at the differences that we have and how to value those differences. And what my call today is to continue that work and to look at each individual as an individual, to look at each classified, each faculty, each management as an individual and all the facets they bring to the table. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Aisha Abdul-Jabbar. Um, good morning, ARC family, and happy late New Year's, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, so today, I have a paper airplane in my hands. And I know you're probably expecting me to say a great metaphor, me connecting this paper airplane to students to ARC. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> this paper airplane has another purpose that will, be, that will be revealed after my speech. Last convocation, I gave a lesson. This convocation, I have a mission. And I could only complete this mission with your help. If you are in, can I get a yes? <laughs> Come on, can I get a louder yes <laughs> for your students? <laughs> I want you to please deliver this message to your student. You can summarize it, but please do not plagiarize. <laughs> can you please tell your student that yes, it is easy to take the path that everyone takes, but if they ever wonder what it really feels to be alive, they could only find that answer in the path that is less taking. Can you tell them that I said, risk taking and getting out of your comfort zone is like discovering a new planet? And if they ask you how, tell them that it starts here. Tell them about the student clubs that are available on campus. Tell them about the student government and tell them about this community. One thing, oh, I miss a part. <laughs> the more they are involved on this campus, the more it's going to feel like a new world. Oh, I forgot my part, sorry. <laughs> One thing that I have learned from being a member of a club, the student senate president and a sage, is that you only get what you give. And the more you work toward benefiting other people, the more the world starts working for you. Well, that's two things. And it's time to relieve the purpose of my paper airplane. Um, the purpose of it, I just wanted to fly a paper airplane because I thought it would be very cool. <laughs> 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 but, but just a little bit warning. If it does hit you, I'm sorry, don't sue me. What do you expect from a college student? And <laughs> And if it does hit you, I mean, I kind of wrote an invisible, I wish you a fast recovery on it. <laughs> yeah. And that is all. Thank you. <laughs> Ignore the man behind the curtain, please. So many of you have been to a lot of convocations, and we're here today to call you out for exactly that. <laughs> we have the uh, privilege of being able to uh, announce uh, service awards, and we're going to begin with uh, folks who have been here uh, providing service to American River College for 20 years. I think we need to click. <laughs> okay. Gary Aguilar. Please stand or wave or do whatever you want because this is a chill environment. <laughs> Susan Andre. John O'Bear. Tuck Ayong. 
Christy Bain. Bethany Black. Paul Barco. Debbie Cameron. Huen To. Dan DeLap. Michael Dixon. Kirsten Dubray. Lori Dume. Robert Gonzalez. Tracy Gordeen. Edward Hashim. Asmat Habib. Eileen Halseth. Kathy Howell. <laughs> Carrie Jumley. Adam Carp. Brian Knurk. Keiko Kamara. Jerome Leahy. Liz Levy. Thomas Logan. David Lopez. Stuart Lokes. Anna Lukowski. Bob Lyman. <laughs> Tiffany Monosh. <laughs> Eric Martin. Karen Millam. Karen Pieces. Robert Quintero. Rick Ramirez. Lori Razor. Mark Rao. Ted Ridgeway. Kelly Riley. Oh, oh thank next you. slide. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thomas Retanagira. Iraj Sobsavre. Hug Scott. <laughs> Craig Smith. Lori Smith. <laughs> Michael Sweet. <laughs> Stephen Thompson. Charles Thompson. Oksana Torshin. <laughs> Teresa Urkowski. Ku Vang. Sam Williams. Denise Wolf. John Hess. Edward Hashima. And Cheryl Howell. Thank you for your 20 years of service. Now, there's some folks who have been here even longer, uh, and those are the folks who have been here for 25 years of service. Uh, 
Good. So we'd like to honor those folks. Mm -hmm. Jose Alfaro. <laughs> Thomas Brunton. <laughs> Kristen Casale. Thank you. Chris Conte. <laughs> Chris Day. Nancy Hafer. I'll say it. Pam Jarash. <laughs> Michael Lewis Strange. Donald McClellan. Rudy Per Pearson. Piercing. <laughs> Glenn Pico. Tom Puckett. Sonny Smith. Randy Walker. Thank you so much for your 25 years of, of uh, ser service, <laughs> dedication, and all of that. Uh, the following folks have been serving at American River College for 30 years. Good. <laughs> Um, Linda Patch, sorry, <laughs> Patch Elder. Patch Elder. Yeah. Kathy Burleson. Kevin Clare. Arlene Clark. Arlene Clark. Joanne English. Tim Finnessy. Um, Todd. Todd Houghton. Yes. <laughs> Renata Lensky. J.R. Mutsunami. Um, Dean Mirror. Mirror. Mary Kami. Ilsa Powell. Sue Rooney. Phil Smith. <laughs> Liz Tadano. Merlin Van Regemorder. Um, Linda Zerzana. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's now thank Ray Ravel for 35 years of experience. Dedication. I know, now we're really getting up there. Uh, let's thank Joel, John Coldiron for 40 years of service. And Tony Peters for 45 years of service. And our grand finale, <laughs> let us thank Tom Brazovich. <laughs> Clearly, American River College is an awesome place to work. <laughs> uh, so, all of our uh, service award folks, uh, they're, you're this is up here for you at the end of convocation to take your certificates with you. Thank you all so much for being here and for all of your service. Let's give another round of applause for all of our wonderful employees of 55 years, 20 years. And now, 
I have the, the wonderful pleasure. Last time, I get to introduce our president for spring 2020, his final. It's been a real pleasure getting to know this particular person. I've known him now a really long time, even before American River, and he served us really well, really, really well. He keeps in mind equity, he keeps in mind us, he keeps in mind our students. You've done an amazing job leading us, Thomas Green, Dr. Thomas Green. Come on up. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. I was, okay, first of all, all the math faculty in the room, this is an approximate number. But I think collectively that was about 2,290 years of service <laughs> that the folks that were recognized today. So let's give them another round of applause. That's amazing. It really is. So um, I wanted to start this morning just by saying thank you. It takes so many people to put convocation together. And I just wanted to acknowledge them, starting with Scott Crow and his crew, our IT folks that uh, are always you know, working to make this go off flawlessly, even though it's chaotic, about two seconds up to before it starts. Um, I want to thank all of our folks um, with Aramark and just everybody involved in putting this together. It's certainly appreciated. And I also wanted to acknowledge some folks who are with us this morning. And I wanted to start with one of our Board of Trustee members, Robert Jones. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here this morning. We're, for, we're very fortunate also to have Chancellor King with us. Uh, Brian, thank you very much. And, and he's wearing the right hoodie now. Thank gosh, the bookstore is right over there. Um, and also, I wanted, to, I wanted to introduce you to, I think you may have been introduced before, but uh, Tamara Armstrong, who is our Associate Vice Chancellor and overseeing technology at the district. Thank you so much for being here as well. Um, Oh, I should probably put my PowerPoint up. Let's see here. Uh, one of the things, you know, I actually didn't have reading glasses before I started. <laughs> I hope this is the right one. Is that it? Is that it? Okay. Don't read what I had to say. Okay, good. Yeah. Those were private notes. Had nothing to do with the presentation. Um, so, um, so again, it's been mentioned, so, you know, happy late new year and welcome to a new decade. And so I wanted, thought about what I wanted to share with you, and I thought maybe we would just, being a new decade, take some time just to reflect back on where we've been as a college, kind of the progress that we have made together. And I wanted to just share some final thoughts with you about what I see in the future and some things that I think I've learned since I've been here that I hope will be important to you as well. So in doing this, I went look back over the last 10 years, and I've kind of blown away by the things that have just emerged for the first time over the last 10 years that are almost commonplace now, like ride sharing, um, I mean, drones and, and the electrification of mobility. I think I went too far, so we see all that. Social media, digital assistance, all of this. And then I was looking back and I thought, well, think about the things that even were before then that came back. And some were pretty cool, in my opinion, like LPs. <laughs> so how many of you went back, dusted off your LPs, and bought a turntable or something and play those now? Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. I just found mine, dusted them off. I have this great Jimi Hendrix bootleg. That's the first thing I'm going to do. As listening. And then, so the other thing, some things came back um, from way before that I, I still scratch my head about and if they should have. So I'll leave that to others to decide. But then, and then some things came up for the first time during the semester that I think were an epic fail. And those are Google Glasses, so. Anyway, so it's been amazing to see. And so, kind of closer to home in our system, to think about over the last 10 years and think about everything that we've experienced, both in the system as it's really focused on significantly improving student outcomes and equity, and all the really well-meaning attempts, right? I think you all still have you know, I don't know, nightmares about some of these, I would imagine, and others. And then think about all the local efforts that we've made. And this is really where our conversation began, certainly when I came to ARC, is that this kind of growing recognition that despite all of that work, right, 
at the high level, institutional level, fundamentally, the outcomes of our students didn't really change, despite all of that time and energy. And what we really came to the conclusion in our conversation, if you remember this slide, and I think most people have heard me say this more than once, that it's really a structural issue and a cultural issue, and that we are perfectly de designed at this institution and others in our system to achieve the outcomes that we get. And every year that happens. And that if we fundamentally want to improve outcomes for our students, there's no initiative that's going to change that. We have to go in and structurally and fundamentally redesign the institution and the corresponding culture. So that's where we started. So what we did is we took a leap of faith. Remember that slide? These are all slides from my past. I actually didn't create anything new. Um, we took a leap of faith. And what we did is we made a commitment to redesign the institution and the student experience. So to move away from a design that was based in kind of a standalone, isolated services and approach to one that was more integrated and seamless for our students. Away from a design that was based on a privileged set of assumptions about what we thought students needed to one that was based on their actual experience and through their eyes. In a design that was less concerned or oriented about whether the students were ready, but rather if we were instructed in such a way or constructed in such a way to meet them where they were at, to know when they walked through the door that they had the innate capacity and the ability to succeed their, in, in pursuing their goals under the right conditions, and that we were designed in a way to meet their individualized needs and to create those conditions so that all students could thrive. And then the next question we asked ourselves is, how the hell do you do that? That's really hard work. And if we would knew how to do it, we would have done it already. So that's why we partnered with Achieving the Dream. Because Achieving the Dream was created to support colleges committed to significantly proving outcomes through bold, holistic redesign of their institutions. And through that process, as you know, we re-envisioned our college. New vision, mission, our commitment to social justice and equity and our strategic goals. And collectively, what that really was is we came together and we said this is, worth, this is the destination worth pursuing and the work involved in this is worthy of sacrifice. And with that, we started to transform that plan into action. So I think the first thing we did back in 17, 18, in a brand new governance process that we were still figuring out that was very painful for a lot of people, I remember that, but folks went forward and what they did is they really came together and they envisioned what that meant, how we would operationalize that. And they designed and made recommendations about how we were going to redesign this institution and really our student facing the redesign of our students' experience. And those three teams came together and they really were at the heart of that work in making those recommendations that the college adopted. The college accepted those and it really also represented their work, really our approach to guided pathways. And from those recommendations, I do want to point out some things that are here now that weren't as a consequence. We have a welcome and support center that's designed to have a more integrated experience for our students. That came from the recommendations out of the work of those teams. Um, our Achieve at ARC program, which is a team-based approach to really supporting the, our newly entering students during their first year, that was based out of the recommendation from these teams. And even if you walk around campus, how many of you have seen the new signage walking around to get here? That's a new wayfinding system that came out of a recommendation from these teams that said, we need to make this campus right, more welcoming and easier to navigate for students. That came out of that work as well. So it's important to see that connection. In 1819, one of the things we saw, the Board of Trustees also recognized that the needs of our students were growing, their basic needs. And so for the first time, they approved a student health fee, which gave us the resources we needed to create a comprehensive health and wellness center. So I just want to acknowledge the Board of Trustees' leadership in that because it's going to make a significant difference. And so with that, a team came together this time last year, actually, and they designed an approach to that, to that wellness center, to that health center. And now I am really excited to share with you, um, well, let's see, we hired a director. Where's Didi? Didi, can you stand to be recognized? Where are you? Didi's the director of our, our health center. Thank you. And I'm really excited to share with you, next month, early in February, we are cutting the ribbon and um, we are having a, a, the, the grand opening of our health center right over here, so we want you to come by. So great work on that. So you see the connection. We also, really importantly, we recognized that in approaching the redesign of our students' experience, that if, if we didn't take that and approach that through a lens of equity and social justice, we really ran the risk of reconstructing the institutional barriers that we intended in our effort was to deconstruct. So a team came together and they created a framework 
a framework around equity about how we approach this work so that it made it so that we recreated the college in a way to ensure the success of all students. And I, we rolled that out in the fall. We shared that with you. And since then, we've been moving forward. So we, we, we stood up an Office of Equity and Inclusion. We hired our first dean of that office, which is Nick Daly, and Nick's here. And we've been moving forward with professional development under the leader of Jen Laflamme in the CTL. Where's Jen? There's Jen. Thank you, Jen. And you might have also saw that we moved forward this semester in one of the recommendations, which was a campus climate survey. Our students took that. And for all of you who, who gave up time in the classroom to do that, thank you so much. It's extremely important. And there's an employee-facing component of that survey, and I ask you to complete that. That's open until February. We'll send out another reminder email. But the input that you provide is going to be so important as we go through and learn more about what we're going to need to do to make this a welcoming, inclusive environment for our students and all of our employees. So I really encourage you to finish, fill that out. We also, under Marsha, Le Marsha Resky's leadership, they came and designed a really thoughtful and forward-thinking approach to where we are with online education and to get in front of that. And their work has been foundational and extremely important, not only to the college, but to the colleges within Los Rios as a whole. And it's really helped create a sense of urgency where we are now moving forward together, all colleges, and really envisioning how we're going to move forward with online education. So I want to give a shout out to Marsha and her entire team. And I, and I do want to say a few other things. One of the things we learned over the years with Achieving the Dream was that as we start to make these student-facing changes, we needed to build capacity in the organization to sustain those. Or you'd be building things on a house of cards. And so you see the other project teams coming together to build and strengthen the capacity in the organization, whether it's around planning, how we approach scheduling, and to ensure we have the best possible facilities. So now I gave you an update on facilities in the fall, so I'll do a little bit more now. So we uh, shared with you, it was just like overnight, the governor approved funding so we could expand the Natomas Educational Center. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Roger, for clapping. Um, move forward on the tech ed modernization as well, which is wonderful. And, and now the plan, those are two are in planning process. So, and I also want to recognize that that as a consequence, we came together and we made a series of recommendations in our facilities master plan that went to our board of trustees for all the colleges. Those recommendations, little changes, but were adopted and supported. And that's really important um, because the schedule for those facilities, I just want you all to know, and is that raise your hand if you reside in Davies Hall. OK. Keep your hands up, if you would, if it's been really difficult to watch a new building go up next to you. <laughs> Right. And you can put your hands down. <laughs> Raise your hand if you received an email from the person who had their hand up asking you if this building was seismically safe this last semester and wanted documented proof that it was. That would be Elisa Shub. OK. I want to let you know the date for you that's really important is 2024. That's when the ground breaks on the replacement building for the new Davies Hall. Now, I do want to share with you one thing, is that the Board of Trustees recognized that in order to move forward with, and to ensure the best possible learning environment over the next decade and so forth, it's going to require resources. So they approved moving forward with a general obligation bond. And that will be on the ballot on March 3rd. Now, I'm not here to advocate for that bond at all. All I'm doing here is to let you know that it's here. And if you want more information, that you can go on the website and find out more. But with those resources, that will support the projects that I just shared with you and many others, both here at ARC and across the district. So that's my, pers that's my public service announcement. I take no position on that, because that would be wrong. All right. Last thing I wanted to show you on this, this section is just where we are now today. We continue to balance the student-facing changes that we need to make to support all our students with the capacity building that we need to do to sustain it. Professional development is a good example that Elisa mentioned as well. So I just want to pause here for a second. I want to look at what's on the screen right now. We started implementing the recommendations from our first project teams only about a year and a half ago. So when I look around and think about the amount of work 
the effort that was created here. I'm just curious, if you were involved in one of these teams or in one of the governance councils during this time period, could you just raise your hand? Look around. There's a lot of people involved in that process. That's really important, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But give yourselves a round of applause. That's an amazing amount of work. So now I just want to talk a little bit about transitions. So, um, so as you know, this is my last, my last uh, convocation, my last semester with ARC, and I certainly have a lot of mixed feelings about it. I know for a fact that I am going to miss being a part of this community on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm also a little, have a little trepidation, because as I was looking back, looking at the last decade, I saw some how other people transitioned out of their careers. <laughs> Um, and I'm really hoping to avoid some of that. I mean, I've already lost my hair. I guess that's a good thing, but anyway, so we're going to stick with the Letterman theme here and do a top 10 list of just a few insights and parting thoughts, some things that I've learned. Well, here's the one thing. So right now, I stand between you and your break and coffee and hanging out with your colleagues. So one of the things I'm getting, finally getting to the point of understanding is trying to be brief. I am not successful at it, but I'm going to try here by doing this. The top three thoughts or insights rather than the top 10. Yeah, that deserves a clap, thank you. All right. So first of all, and this is really important, this is one of the things that I will take with me is that all of you are absolutely extraordinary. And I'm in a position to see this in ways, I don't see it all, but I see it in ways that you may not. And I wanna share that with you. Um, and let me start by sharing a little bit of a story. I, so this fall, I actually enrolled in a welding class with Professor Mark Reese. And again, I'm gonna to have to say thank you to Mark for allowing me to sit in the class. Like, yeah, who wants the college president in their class, right? Uh, but I wanted to share a story. I was in the lab where they welding, they have these bays, and, and I think pretty much no one really knew who I was. And we're covered in these leather kind of smocks and gloves and safety glasses and this thing that flops down over my head when I don't want it to. Um, so it's hard to see. And we're standing, I'm and I'm looking, there was a student next to me in the outside the booth and he looked really anxious and so I went over and just started chatting with him. I said, so what do you, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm about to get, try to get certified in a cert certain type of weld. Um, I said, oh, okay. And I said, so and why, why are you doing that? I just wanted more. He said, well, I have a part-time job at McClellan right now, but if I can get certified in this weld, I'm going to be eligible for a full-time job with benefits and an $8 an hour increase. Not kidding. And he said, and so I'm here to kind of learn, but also to get certified. And he goes, because, he goes, I have a wife, I have a kid, and I can't afford to get certified outside of here. It costs hundreds of dollars to go through a certification. But our faculty incorporated that into the class so that's part of the class for the students. And I thought, that's amazing. That is not just teaching the content. That is about making a difference. So absolutely. And, so I talked to the student, next week he comes back, he got the job. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I know that that happens in, in other ways, in different disciplines across the college of what you do. I know, I see that you are extraordinary when, when, I, when I'm between meetings and I'm running over here to get a salad, well most likely it's a piece of pizza, um, <laughs> and I'm standing in line to pay. And I see our cashiering staff talking to students, asking them how they, how they did on that test they were studying for the other day, because they made a connection they remembered. That's extraordinary. What's extraordinary is when I walk around this campus, despite the construction, and see how beautiful it is and how well maintained it is, because it really reflects the care, right, and the commitment that our staff do. That's extraordinary. It, you know, and I, I don't actually see it, but I know it from my own experience that we have students that show up in our counseling offices with, in despair, and they come out after a very short meeting with, with a renewed sense of hope and direction that they haven't had. That's extraordinary. And you do that every single day. Now, every, you know, every convocation, I try to share some kind of more recent events that I think align here about some other things that are extraordinary. I wanted to share a few of those with you. So this is our educational talent search program. We have eight TRIO programs at this college now, which is pretty large, and three of those are educational talent search. And they're focused on supporting middle school and high school students thinking about preparing and committing to going to college, right? First time, low-income students. Now, 
Last year, Diana Garcia and her team served 1,478 middle and high school students in these TRIO programs. Here's the thing. All the seniors of those 1,478, every single one graduated with a regular high school diploma. 80% immediately went on to college. And of those 80%, 30% of those, or three out of eight, are here at ARC right now. Now, I also want to talk about excellence. I had an opportunity. Um, Professor um, Kinothea came to see me. He said, hey, I want to talk to you about something, and I want to bring my students, and I wanted to share something with you. So we sat down in my office one day, and the students came in, and they shared with me about their experience of going to the Global Entrepreneurship Boot Camp, which they won. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> but they talked about how important that experience was to work together right, in different areas as part of a team on a project that mattered. And that wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for our faculty, our faculty advisors, um, whether it's one of our clubs, or the other club, we create that every day. This is extraordinary. And so this is really powerful, and I wanted to share that with you as well. And then our American River Review. So uh, Michael Spurgeon provided leadership for that for years, and now it's Michael Angeloni, and then they just won Best Magazine in the Nation this last year. So So I really want you to know, it is, it is an honor to serve with so many extraordinary people. And it happens day in and day out. We focus on these large things. That's where I spend a lot of my time. But it's in that day to day. And hold on, that's very powerful. Uh, and that makes a difference. I wanted to share something briefly about collaboration as well. So I would love to be up here as my last convocation and tell you that the future is going to be more predictable, that the pace is going to slow down, right? and it's going to be less chaotic. If I did that, you know I would be lying to you. It's actually the opposite. And as we move forward, we're going to still see kind of these disruptive change and so forth. But here's one of the things that I've taken from the work that all of you have been involved in, is that more and more what I see is our ability to move forward and actually achieve the outcomes we're looking for is going to become more dependent on the approach we use to get there. And that we aren't going to be able to move forward and just ask for people to buy into things. We're going to have to find processes where we truly come together and co-create solutions to what are going to be very complex problems as we move forward. That has been so clear to me. And I just don't mean here at the college, across departments or divisions, though that's going to be important. I see in a way that we are going to have to collaborate across our colleges in Los Rios at a much deeper level than we've been doing or had have been having to do up to this point. That will determine our ability to move forward, is that we're going to have to move forward together. And we're going to have to continue to build out ways to do that in a very authentic way where everyone feels a sense of contribution and ownership for it. Now, I share that with you just so you can kind of see this is my thinking moving forward as, as I see kind of the, read the tea leaves. But I also want to share something else with you. The work that you have done, the approach that you have created, it's not perfect but it is a foundation for really authentic collaboration. And don't lose sight of the value for that. I have had, you wouldn't see this, I've had two phone calls over the last month from college presidents asking about our processes and approach to our work and our governance system. Asking about, because they're looking at theirs and they're re recognizing that they have to change and they've heard about this. I have another college that someone shared with you recently that actually adopted components of it. You have something special in this that actually is the foundation is trust. That it requires trust to move forward with what you've designed. And in doing so, in relying on trust, you will strengthen that trust further. And I want to make sure that I had an opportunity to share how powerful that is. That is going to be one of the greatest strengths of this institution moving forward. And the last thing I just wanted to share with you is gratitude and love. I want you to know a few things that I experienced when I first came here that I had never felt more welcomed when I came through this front door. I mean, I was this brand new president, wide-eyed, scared, <laughs> coming in. And I was welcomed into this organization by so many people, and it made such a huge difference to me. Um, and so I wanted you to know that, that it meant everything to me at that time. 
and I, and I share that because you're going to have an opportunity to welcome a new president into this organization with amazing gifts and to know how important that will be to that individual as well. Um, I want to thank you for the leap of faith that you took with me and with one another as we move to redesign this institution. Um, I will leave. That is, I can't tell you how important that feels to me, that you are willing to do that and trust one another. And we are at the beginning of that work. It is a, arc is long, uh, but I am so encouraged by the work that you've done. I want to thank you for the grace that you have extended me when I failed you as a leader. And most importantly, I want to thank you for the work that you do day in and day out on behalf of our students, the passion and commitment that you bring to your work every day. I mean, we have the best jobs in the world because we get to serve people in helping them realize their dreams. Think about that, how many people don't have that opportunity, and you do, and you do it in such an extraordinary way. So thank you, and I would say have an extraordinary spring term. Be extraordinary on behalf of your students. Thank you. Can we all agree that he's extraordinary, right? I, I don't think there's anybody in this room that could think that he failed us in any way. They can't. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> Just as much as he has stories, we all have great stories as well. And um, we, we just want to thank you so much for the bottom of my heart. You will absolutely be missed. So thank you for leading us the way that you have. We appreciate you. So what's happening next? We have a few breakout sessions that are going to take place. And we'd like to ask you to come back after the break, um, after some of these breakout sessions as well. All right, so you can take a look inside the PowerPoint and see the different rooms. You can take a look, fine arts. Um, the, there's be a breakout session for arts in Arts 547, Davies Hall 202, and so on and so forth. I probably don't have to read them all to you. <laughs> All right, so please come back. We will be back here at 1130.